Okay, so today we are going to start to put uh, our uh, JavaScript code into some context, some web context, okay? Uh, starting from, from the server side. So today we'll be working on building a small uh, web server, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even if we are going to use it in a different way from uh, uh, the, the classical client-server model, but we'll come to that. Uh, just uh, one very you know, short uh, introduction or reminder about uh, uh, what uh, we mean when we think about uh, a web architecture. Okay, so this is a picture that I took from the uh, Mozilla documentation, if I remember correctly, um, that uh, summarizes all the different pieces of the uh, architecture of the many possible architectures that we, we can build with, uh, with the web technologies. Hmm? So, uh, the first uh, block here um, is the, the browser, the client. Okay, so when we are talking about web application, we are already thinking about uh, uh, some software that can be accessed, uh, some application, some functionality that can be accessed through a browser. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll meet the browser in a couple of weeks, um, but okay, uh, from the internal point of view, but we already know basically that uh, it's, uh, uh, no, it's based on the uh, HTML and CSS technologies for uh, displaying web pages, and uh, it includes a JavaScript uh, interpreter and an object model for representing the page. So this is our runtime environment uh, that interacts with the users. Okay, here, yeah, all these interaction is done with the browsers. That's a link. And in the browser, we have some, the possibility of running some JavaScript code. That is what will enable us to, to learn and, and uh, first, uh, first uh, front-end programming and then the React framework for front-end uh, development. This is on the uh, client side. Then we have the whole, all the, the backend, okay, which is uh, the servers, the set of servers that host uh, the real uh, web application. And these two communicate uh, through a very simple protocol, HTTP, that you probably already know, and we will recall the main points uh, today, no? uh, because the, the only glue that, that links, uh, well, not the only, there are also web sockets, but there are uh, or for, or just for specific applications, but they are the only glue that links the client with the server, okay, the front end with the back end. All information that goes to the user, okay, has to be in the browser, and to get into the browser, it should have traveled through this channel, okay? So uh, the only, <laughs> all the information that we have, the uh, the text, the layout, the images, the interaction, the algorithms, the JavaScript code itself should come from the server, okay, through an HTTP channel, okay, through a channel made by the HTTP protocol. And uh, we'll see that this channel will be used uh, mainly for two different purposes. One is, uh, let's say, pages, oh, sorry, what did they do? One is uh, pages, web pages. I mean HTML, CSS, everything that picks up uh, the layout of a page. Uh, the browser connects to the server, and the server replies with the HTML file, with the CSS files, with the icons, with the color, or whatever. And data. Okay. Uh, once the page is loaded, the client and the server can or will still interact by exchanging <coughs> data, exchanging information. Okay, in modern web architectures, we don't have just the server providing the HTML code, the web page, and then that's it. All the information is in the page. Right now, after the page has been delivered, on the client side we have some JavaScript code that maybe needs some, inform some part of information, asks for some extra, uh, um, extra information from the server while the web page is still the same. So we have only one channel, the HTTP channel, and it's used for two different purposes. Okay, uh, in the first case, uh, 
the browser needs an HTML container that contains a page with some information. And this is only you know, uh, loaded once, once per page. The browser lays out, and in the classical web, uh, the classical times of the web technologies, so maybe 20 years ago, that was it. The client, the, the browser, asks for a page from the server, the server delivers the page, and that's it. All the information that was in the HTML was displayed, and the only interaction the user could do is click on links. And every link should, we would, in the, in the past, trigger a reload of the page, so a new request for a new page. Okay? But this was a long time ago. Nowadays, uh, when you load a, load a page, uh, you also load a lot of uh, JavaScript code into the page. And this JavaScript code allows the web page inside the browser, the application running inside the web page, to interact further with the server, to get additional data, to send data, to customize the content, and so on. OK? So there are, technically, it's still the same protocol, but practically, we are designing those two aspects in very different ways. One is uh, the web page loading, the application, I would say, again, it doesn't like me. So the application, and the other are the data are sent and received through what we call the API, the application programmer interface. So when we build a web server, we should think at both uh, 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 aspects. One is uh, I need to provide in the web server some HTML files, some CSS files, some images, and so on, for the browser to compose the page. And some JavaScript that will also be loaded by the browser. And that was for, will be for the initial page load. And then once the page is loaded, the JavaScript code that I put into the page will use additional calls, uh, and we distinguish them by calling the, the API calls that the server provides to read and write, actually this arrow should be both ways, uh, read and write uh, data on the server. Okay, so today we are going to start from here. So uh, imagine that the server needs to be available for providing further data or for storing data coming from a client. And the client, in our mind, will be the JavaScript code inside the web page. Later on, we will learn how to, how to do that on the browser. And so, uh, I said that we are using HTTP as a channel. This is just a, a picture for the HTTP standard. Uh, we'll, we will see today that there are several different methods in the HTTP protocol, not, not head, but head, get, post, and put, and delete that we are, we are going to use to provide uh, uh, a set of programming interfaces to, to, the, to the server. But that's for later today. And so the, the other point where we are going to focus today is the web server itself, uh, which is basically a manager of the HTTP protocol. So it gets HTTP requests. Remember that HTTP is a request response protocol. Uh, a client sends a request packet. Uh, to the server, the server receives the request, uh, processes that, and returns a response. There are two, let's say, text files, the, the re both the request and the response. So it's a very simple protocol. And the web server itself uh, is the application that listens for incoming requests, uh, processes any of them according to, uh, to the URL and to the parameters, and then returns uh, some content as a response, okay? Uh, how the server computes the response starting from the request, so give me the home page of Politecnico, okay? So it would be a get uh, slash, give me the home page on the Politecnico web server. So there is some logic, some software there, the web server, that knows how to build the HTML content that corresponds to the, to, to the home page. And this means that on the server, we have some logic which is uh, hard-coded. 
So the part that deals with HTTP knows to, how to do the handshake, how to do the certificates, how to do the encryption, redirection, all the handling of the HTTP protocol. This is standard. Every web server in the world works in the same way. Plus some application logic that knows what to be, how to respond, actually contains the logic of our, of our application. Okay, and it's written in some language. Uh, I don't know, for example, the example of the Polytechnic website, which is written in, in Drupal, that is implemented in PHP no? as a programming language. We are going to implement the application logic in JavaScript. Okay, so we have the HTTP and the HTTP protocol plus containing some application code on the server side. The application code will be used both for delivering pages, as we said before, and for providing APIs. In both cases, we need to know how to respond to a request. Okay? Uh, in this course, we are mainly focusing here. Okay? We are not uh, considering the generation of web pages uh, because we will generate them on the client side uh, in, in React. Okay, so our main focus will, the, the reason why we are discussing about the server in, in this course that is, uh, say, uh, basic, basically on the front end topics uh, is that we need uh, some, <laughs> some place where to implement some APIs. And what are the APIs for? For, as it mentions, uh, to access data. And where is data coming from? From a persistent layer, persistence layer in the server. So a database. We already played with SQLite or the, uh, similar databases uh, that can store information. This information about uh, mm -hmm. questions and answers in our exercise uh, is needed by the browser. So the browser must be able to show all the questions, question one, answer one, answer two. And what does it get this information? Well, it asks it from, from the server through an HTTP request that will trigger some JavaScript code that will run a query on the database whose result is processed and sent back to the browser and will be interpreted by the JavaScript code again on the client to extract the information and paint the page, put that on the page. This is the cycle that we already have. Data is stored, locked away here and we need to display it there. And everything will go through the HTTP protocol and the server, and the API server. Okay, this is the game we are playing. We must be playing. Just remember that once we have a, user, a user here, we also have another user there with their own browser, which is playing the same game. And another thousand users, people with many hands and legs and heads, with their browsers also accessing at our website at the same time. So we only have one server which is centralized, one database which is centralized, but many clients which are distributed. That will put in our mind the warning lamp saying, okay, just be careful because this JavaScript code on the client is only linked to one user, one to one. This JavaScript code on the server must simultaneously accept requests or process requests from many users. And that would involve some sort of asynchronous overlapping of the requests. So I can never be sure uh, that I'm the only one managing or reading or modifying that data into the database. Mm -hmm. That's just a constant worry mm, uh, for us to worry about. Okay. Uh, and this picture today was powerful enough uh, to, to uh, empower not only all the web applications that we have today, which are very interactive, and so we, you load a page and then uh, you, uh, the JavaScript on the page will continue to interact with the server, uh, but also all the mobile world works in the same way. Okay, this uh, programming uh, by separation of the user interface on the browser, and the logic and the data, which are 
you know, uh, managed behind an API interface, enables to reuse the same API for uh, web applications and for mobile applications or desktop applications, but nobody's uh, developing desktop applications anymore, unfortunately. Okay, so it's very important to have this clear separation between what are the APIs that I'm offering to access, to be able to access my data. And then I can build the applications on top of it. Okay, so you see a lot of uh, uh, you know, websites around, you have the web version, you have the mobile version. They are not exactly the same. They are designed in different ways, of course. They are different products, but they use the same data. And in many cases, they reuse the same API, the same interface for building different. And you see many uh, you know, uh, open source applications go even farther because you have many uh, possible front-end applications. No, I, for example, think of, of Telegram, no, which is very common. You have many different clients. No, you can uh, have the official one or, or different one you can install, and they all use the same set of APIs, but they create, there are different applications that they can reuse the same APIs to provide maybe a slightly different user experience or whatever. Hmm? So this is the, the, the context in which we are working. And let's uh, see how we can implement that uh, in, in JavaScript, okay? So th that was just a motivation picture. <laughs> now we go into the uh, actual code. So um, what we said is that we need an HTTP, um, yes, a web server, an HTTP server that contains a standard part, uh, manage the HTTP protocol. I don't want to be involved in that. Okay, it's standard, and allows me to extend that behavior by writing some application-specific logic in JavaScript. In JavaScript, because we chose to, but we could uh, have uh, no, uh, uh, web servers uh, that can be extended in Java, in PHP, in uh, .NET, and whatever you want. We chose JavaScript just because you know, it's the language we use in this course. And there are several uh, different uh, packages in JavaScript uh, in, on the NPM store that do this job. One of the simplest ones is called Express, Express.js. Hmm? And it's a, a simple web server uh, that web slash application server. It manages the web protocol by itself, plus it allows me to define my own application logic. And uh, we are using it uh, mainly, as we said, for uh, hosting the APIs and, uh, and allowing access to our data uh, from, from the external. Uh, just a reminder, since everything is uh, uh, relying on, uh, on the HTTP protocol, just a quick reminder, HTTP, as we, as we mentioned, is a client, uh, sorry, a request response protocol. So this means that all communication, all data exchange, is always started, is always initiated by the client, by the browser. The server can never contact the browser itself, can only respond to requests that come from the client. This will be a problem if we want to do some continuous updating and so on. OK, let's put the problems aside. We'll come to them one by one. Um, but in its simplicity, HTTP is just a, a small block of text we, that we call the HTTP request, and a small or larger block of text that we call the HTTP response. And both of them, request and response, are composed by three parts. So the package that, we are, that is sent over the network, it's, uh, they have a first line, a header and a body. The first line of the request is the command, is the verb, is the action that we are requiring. The first line of the response is the status. Did the operation go well or not? Then we may have one or more headers in the request, one or more headers in the response, and possibly, you see that this is dashed, a body of the request that contains data 
and a body on the response that contains other data. Uh, this is the simple structure. Um, so the, the first line is always, as mentioned, the method or the, the verb, uh, sometimes we call it like that, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the request. And these are the main methods that the HTTP protocol supports and defines. 99% of the web requests are using the get method, where the browser is asking for some data from the server. That can be an image, can be an HTML code, can be some data, get request some data. Uh, and there are also so data from the server to the client. There are also two methods for sending data from the client to the server. When I write a message and I click on send, we are sending some data from the client to the server. So the, the HTTP methods for doing that are called uh, post or put. Post is mainly used or designed for um, sending also forms in the initial days of, of, the, of the web when we click on, a, on the submit of a form and we will, we will jump to a, to a different page. Uh, the difference between post and put, we'll see that from the semantic point of view, is that uh, semantically post uh, gives you new, new data and put updates existing data. Huh? So we can use that in a, in a different way. Hmm. Um, or oh, they can also be a delete. Uh, of course, you are not deleting a web page or whatever. We are using this, which is a protocol, uh, to give new meaning to these verbs. So get was designed to get HTML pages. But we are going to use get to extract data, the list of questions, for example. Um, post was designed for sending a form that the user filled. We are going to use uh, post maybe to create a new user, okay, for creating new data on the server. We are reusing the semantics of HTTP methods that were invented uh, in 1992 or whatever. Um, we, where JavaScript was not in the mind of anybody. We are reusing those, the semantics of those methods for, as, a, as building blocks for our APIs. Okay? Because that's what we have. The client and the server can only communicate through HTTP, so we can use that, and we try to use it well. Hmm? Uh, well, the response is easy because it just uh, mainly tells you if everything was okay or not. We have a set of uh, uh, calls that uh, you, know, you see by navigation. Usually, the, the calls in the 200 range are green. They were okay. In the 300 range means that something has to be changed, or so redirection, basically. Okay, the, the response is not bad, but you should require it from a different uh, address. And the 400 codes uh, are client error. So the browser asks for a resource that shouldn't have been asked. The, the, the URL is wrong, you don't have the permission, or something like that. While the 500 codes are the server errors, okay? The, the request was okay, but the server for some reason crashed or uh, lost the connection to the database uh, or is over the, uh, it's uh, overloaded and so it cannot respond or something like that. So 200 and 300 is okay, 400, some problem on the client side, 500, some problem on the server side, just to summarize a lot. And this already gives us uh, some status information, it gives the browser some status information about how the request is sent uh, went. And of course, if the response is uh, 200, in the 200 range, we will have also probably the content of the response itself, okay, the data that we asked. Uh, we are not spending too much time in the header lines. We can have some headers defined in the client, some headers defined in the, in the server that complete the information or specified information. Uh, uh, you say that uh, in HTTP we are 46 headers defined, but more, many more are used even if they are not in the standard. And uh, uh, I only focus on, uh, on basically one or two, and we'll see, but the, the most important one is uh, um, 
a header which is called content type that describes uh, the uh, structure of the body. Okay, so for example, I'm asking for some data and the response is uh, a table of numbers. How do I encode this table of numbers? As a text file? As a JavaScript object? As a CSV file? Formatting? So content type is, the, is an information in the header of the, re of the request or in the header of the response that specifies how to decode the response itself. Maybe an image, maybe an HTML page, maybe a text file, maybe a JavaScript file, JavaScript data file in JSON format. JSON stands just for JavaScript object notation. So like curly braces, square brackets, and so on, that describes an object. And uh, it's important for the browser and the server to be able to parse and access the data in the body to have the correct uh, content type, so we'll need to sort it by, by hand in many cases, okay? So this is the uh, general structure of HTTP messages, and this table uh, summarizes the main uh, methods that are supported by the protocol and how they compose. Uh, so you see that some methods do not support having a request body. When we do a get, uh, I never have a body. When I have a post or a put, uh, possibly or <laughs> usually I have the body because I'm sending some data and so this data is stored here in the body. From the response, normally a get returns a response because I'm reading some, some, from some information, so this information will be stored in the body of the response. And uh, the other where the, the writing method usually don't return any body, but may also do it if they want, so it's optional, okay? Um, so these are, are the allowed combinations. Get is for reading, post and pot are Post and put are for writing, okay? So that's this uh, uh, symmetry. Uh, this column, either impotent, is be, will be useful for us to uh, say that the protocol it, uh, requires the implementation of this method to be or not idempotent. Idempotent, I don't know how to pronounce this word. Never mind. Um, what does it mean? It means that if I call the method twice in a row, the result will be the same as calling it only once. So if I load the web page of Polytechnico twice, I get the same result. No data, no data changes, no, no data is affected by this operation. I can load an image once and then cache it or load it every time I go to that page. I will have a lot of more gets to the same image, but nothing changes functionally. Even potent, so the, uh, it has the same power, repeating that as the same power as just asking for once. Um, what it means that post is not even potent? It means that if I'm posting a message, hello, and immediately after I'm posting another message, hello, that, we, that will be two messages. So, every, so I cannot just repeat the post and expect uh, to have the same result. It will be an additional result. So you must be careful with that. Put, uh, as we said, is a, a method for modifying existing data. Okay, so if I posted a message with hello and then I want to change this message by adding a question mark, so I put, I, I give a put method by saying hello with a question, uh, with an explanation mark, that will change a resource. The message is already there, I'm changing the message. And if I change it again with the same new version, the second change doesn't really change anything. So I can repeat the operation of uh, overwriting or changing uh, some operation. So the question is, if I repeat the operation more than once, uh, does it change the result? Yes, in the case of post, 
and no in all the other cases. But this is not automatic, okay? This is something that we must guarantee in our implementation of these methods. So if I see uh, some, some person that implements a get method, for example, to increment, increment a counter, that is big wrong. You can do that. There's nothing <laughs> impossible in the JavaScript code to do. But uh, we, you will be outside of the intended meaning of the get uh, operation, and you are asking for trouble because maybe the browsers will do many gets uh, when you navigate to another page, when you refresh the browser, and so on. They assume that it's always OK to reload the same resource because that's in the specification. OK, so when we go to the code, we tend to, to forget. We tend to just uh, find a solution that is working for us. But let's try, let's try always remember to program in a clean way, OK, to use the method according to what they are. Um, OK, the last column, we are not very interested in that, uh, is telling us that of all these methods, the only two that are natively used by the browser are get and post. When you are interacting with links and, and, uh, and forms, uh, only get and post are used. All the other methods are for us to program. Yes? Uh, post is uh, imaging add and put is modify, okay? If I say add your name to the list and again I say add your name to the list, your name will be twice to the list, okay? But if I say add your name to the list, okay, it's added and then modify it and then modify it again, the second modification doesn't really do anything if the modification, if the the parameters are the same, of course. Okay, so making two modifications in the same way of, to the same object uh, doesn't create a new object. We'll just rewrite the same, the same modification. Hmm? Yes? Yes. So the, the idea is that if you want, you want to have some uh, side effect also in the get. No? So for example, Google, uh, you mentioned Google anal Analytics, so I want to have a statistics of how many web pages were visited and where. And of course, in that case, uh, I will be logging the gets. Uh, what I'm saying about uh, uh, idempotent is, does it change the state of the application? Okay, does it change my database? If I want to monitor and or log or have statistics about what is happening, of course I'm uh, re uh, recording whether the, the get is called many times or only once. That would be different for me, of course, from the statistic point of view, from the analytics point of view. But it shouldn't, care, uh, shouldn't affect how the application is working, how the data is shown to the user. If you have an anxious user that reloads your web page three times, the pay will pay will be the same. No? Maybe you just have a add a pop up like call down guy. Uh, there's nothing new right now. But uh, uh, of course, in the in, in the log files and uh, in, in the statistics of the of the web server, you will see those many calls. Hmm? But the idea is that the application doesn't care, shouldn't affect the application. If you want to measure it, it's an aside. Of course, it's not. Uh, it's not totally clean as a concept. You want to have some, some, some side effects which are outside the application scope. OK. How does uh, uh, Express work? As I mentioned, Express is one of the many, maybe the most popular uh, HTTP server written in JavaScript. OK. And uh, it's in the Express pa um, package. So you can install it. And uh, uh, let's try to do it. So let's, be, let's close this one and open a terminal. I created a folder called Express into week four. It's, it's just empty. So let's initialize. And uh, yes, I don't care. OK. And I install, install. Express. Uh, 
Okay, and now I can create a file called index.js. Sorry, let's create it in the right folder. New file index.js. Or if you want, use mjs, it's always okay. Hmm? Okay. So, uh, right now we have this uh, file that contains a web server. How does a web application look like? Well, the simplest web application is composed of these three statements. Uh, create the application itself with the express function that we are importing from the package and uh, activate the web server on a given port. App is the application, app.listen starts the application by listening on a specific port, uh, 3000, whatever, and it calls a callback when everything is started. Okay, so an empty website is just a tree from uh, import uh, express, the express function from the package uh, express that we just, well, we just installed. We defined, uh, we create an application and we start this application. And listen as two parameters. One is the port. By convention, we are running on 3000 or 3001. Usually, we are using these numbers. And a callback that will tell us that the application has started. Okay. This is an empty website. When, when I run it, node, sorry, wrong way, node index.mjs, sorry, I need to save it first. We just print application started, and you see that the program is not uh, finished. I don't have the prompt anymore. The program is still running. You remember what we did with timers. As long as is there's some asynchronous pending task, the application doesn't stop. And this is the same here. The application is alive forever. Okay? It executes the line 5, app.listen, and it schedules some listener in the background. This listener is always active. So the application doesn't stop, doesn't return. Okay? It's always, un until I, I, I kill it with the control C statement, uh, keyboard press. Okay, I have a nice uh, website now running on my uh, computer on port 3000. So I could open a browser and uh, connect to localhost 3000. And the browser will tell me, yeah, there's something there, but it doesn't respond to this request. See the difference? If I stop that, I try to reload this page here. Sorry, what did? The browser times out. There's no server at this address normally. Okay? If I start the application, I'm running a server, but this server is not responding to any address. It's not programmed to respond to any address. So the connection is made, but it's immediately dropped. So I'm starting it, i reloading that, and I see an error message. Well, I want to see more. Let's open the inspector. Okay, the inspector in the browser, I'm using Firefox, you may be using uh, other browsers, but they're always there. In Firefox, we have F12, uh, which is the keyboard uh, shortcut, but uh, in all the browsers, we have this, uh, uh, where that? The developer tools somewhere, where we have the, yeah, all the developer tools within 
that will be is, they are a debugger for us inside the browser okay and there's a network panel that can show you what is going on at the protocol level at the HTTP level so this network panel actually is showing me the HTTP that exchange between the client and the server and uh, what is saying here is that uh, we try to make sorry let's close this we try to make a get call that received the for zero far not found error and if we, if we uh, see it we see we have a, a request which was empty and the response uh, with that, that contained an error message hmm? so we'll get familiar with that uh, we, we don't want a website with no content. We should create some content on the website. And to do that, we must extend this application by um, registering some handler to some requests. So right now, our, my browser made a get to the, the root of the website and there was no handler to respond to that request. This request was made of a get and slash, the method and the address. So I register a handler on this address. So before starting the application, I register me some handler for some specific requests by specifying the method and the addresses, okay? And uh, when a get method is called upon this address, then execute a callback. Oh, we have it in the slide. App.get slash, so I'm registering a handler for the get method when it's called on the root of the website. And this will execute a callback. The callback that Express will call it is a function with two parameters, request and response. Request is an object that represents all the information in the request itself that just came from the browser. And the response is an object that represents all the information that will be in the response of my, um, of my handler. And this response will be sent to the browser. OK, so every time I specify a web page in, uh, or uh, an endpoint uh, in, uh, in Express, we always have a callback like that, request, uh, request and response. And then we have the code for managing that. So we could use the request object to query about something about the request. Right now, we don't have anything to query about, but we'll see that the request object contains a lot of information that we can use. And the response object contains also some information that we, we can set, we can modify it. We are building the, re the response object. So Express will prepare a, response, a very simple response object for us, and we can customize it according to what we need to, re to return. And the response also has some methods for delivering the response. The simplest one is send. And we are sending a message, for example, a string. It can be a string, it can be an HTML page, it can be an image, it can be a file. Some content that goes into the body of the response. In this case, the send method sets the body of the response and closes the request and sends the response back to the browser. Okay, after send, nothing happens. Because this closes the request. Okay, you may have some code after the send, but uh, it's always the same rule. Send will be asynchronously executed, so the code that you could do after that cannot affect the response anymore. So normally, it's the last, it's the, the last statement, the last useful statement. 
So if I change it like that, uh, of course, I need to stop the application and run it again because I changed the file. So save, stop, and restart. And right now, if I reload this page, I should see this message, hello there. And you see that the response code is now 200 and no longer 404. And you see that the response was interpreted as HTML. We really didn't think it was HTML, just a text file. But by default, the content type is interpreted as HTML, not as text. We didn't set the the content type, and you see the response. If you see raw, it's just these characters that are interpreted as an HTML page. And the headers of the response, we see the response is 11 bytes long. It's in HTML. The server said that. Express said that this was an HTML response because send assumes that, but we can change it. The date and other headers in the response that we built in Express. And these are the re header request, the, requ the headers in the request that the browser did and sent to us. OK? Most of these are just uh, for handling the, the protocol so we don't have to care. And this is the status that we generated from this request. Of course, if I want to uh, navigate to a different website, uh, a different page, I will get an error. Slash A, will, I, I will need to have a, a, to register and handler for and a different get method and so on. OK? But this is the basic idea. For every route, for every address that you want to support, you must register a handler on that route, on that address, and on that method. Um, and this is the, the, the general syntax for defining a new route. Uh, we are using the, the verb, the, the routing, because we are, say, routing a request to a given callback, to a given method to handle it. So we are re express receives the request for, for every address, for every method. And it needs to decide where to send them or whether to reject them because there's nobody to send it to. So this is the, an internal routing mechanism. Taking the, this request and routing it to the real, to the actual piece of code that is able to handle, to understand and to handle that. That's why we use this routing verb. It goes down until it finds the code that is able to handle that. And uh, up is the application. Dot method, so I, we may have app.get that will register a handler for get, or gap.post, dot put, dot delete. So these are all the HTTP methods. And or say maybe get, post, put, delete, or all that will catch all the methods. On on a specific path. And then the callback, which is the handler of the response that we'll have to generate the error response and it's executed when the, the route is matched. And uh, as I said, the, the handler function is a callback that gets two arguments, the request and the response. The request uh, main uh, uh, properties are on the left of this picture. I highlighted the ones that are most likely to be useful. Uh, method, for example, will tell us, is this a get or a post or a put? Of course, if we made a registered uh, just a post, uh, the method will always be post, because other type of uh, request will never be routed to me. Uh, but in other cases, maybe I, I try to catch all the requests I need to Understand them. Uh, the body of the request, if there is a body, we'll see that we are not probably using this body uh, di directly because uh, it's, uh, it's a buffer, it's a streaming buffer, and we need uh, some other method to be able to parse the body into something that can be used, into a JavaScript string or a JavaScript object. Hmm? But we'll come to that. Um, and then information about uh, 
the address itself. You know that a name, a web address can contain some parameters. Hmm? Get uh, you know, the address and then question mark name equal to Fulvio. And name and Fulvio are some query parameters that can be extracted by these properties. Uh, query or params, uh, we'll see how to extract information from dynamic addresses, dynamic URLs. Okay, so it's all there. Uh, we have some mechanisms for extracting information from the request. And the response, uh, on the other side, we basically have methods, not properties. So the, the request uh, is there. We can only read information from that, nearly. The response, we can call methods. Uh, and uh, ends the response without providing any body. There are some type of requests that don't need the body. But you need to, so you need to provide the body back to the browser. But you need to send a response, even an empty response, which is not really empty. There's a first line and there are the headers. So and we'll just send the headers of the response, say, okay, this is closed. I don't have any body to give to you, but let's close the request. Otherwise, the browser will still keep hanging and waiting. So every request must be responded to. Every callback must end with a sending method. And will send an empty body. Send will send a specific body. That may be an object, may be a string. We may have a, a JavaScript object that we want to serialize into JSON. JSON is JavaScript object syntax with braces and columns and so on, or redirecting. So in some way, we must respond to, the, to this request. Or maybe we can send an error. Why not? We can send a status of an error status and then close it. Okay? So we analyze the request, we decide what we need to respond, and then we respond with one of these methods. And this will close the transaction. And we can forget about that request and go to the next one, coming from another user. Hmm? This is just the life uh, of, of, the, uh, of the HTTP server. It stands there listening for requests from, other, from any user in the world, from any address that can arrive to this. Uh, and it must respond to each of them. Okay, these are detail about how the response methods do. No, send is down for sending some body. And the sense an empty response. And the status will send the response code. And it can be changed with send or end. So all these methods always return a copy of the, of the object itself, of the response object. So they can easily be changed if you want to set a status and then um, Provide the body or just end the request. And if you want to send a, no, a JavaScript object, which is what we are, what we want to do most of the time, you can use the JSON method that just uh, takes that object and serializes that into a string. Then it is then, then sent to the to the server, to, to the client, and the, the client can uh, then parse the string and recreate the object. Hmm? Um, okay. So, there are two shortcuts that I want to show you right now. One is uh, um, every time we modify it, something, uh, as, we, as we said before, uh, we must uh, save the file, stop the application, restart it in order to be visible. Okay? There is a nice uh, uh, application called Nodemon. Uh, so I need to install it first, uh, npm install globally nodemon. It's called node monitor, basically, which is a, a small application that uh, I install it globally, so on my computer and not on this project, so that it will be available for all the projects. So I'm not storing it my, in the package.json of this. I install it my computer, 
And if I start the application with the comma node mon instead of node, it's called index.mjs, it will start the application normally, but if I modify it, uh, as soon as I save the file, it will restart the application by, for me. So it's a handy way of having the application being restarted automatically every time I save the file. So I don't need to remember to kill and restart the application because it always happens when I debug, I change something, and then I test, nothing changed because I forgot to re restart the application and so on. Okay, so if you want, instead of running it again by hand every time you modify something, use this monitor, not monitor, and that will monitor, that's, that's the name, monitor the files that you are writing, and if you change any of these files, it will restart the application for you. Hmm? And these are all the, on the server side. Another, uh, you know, hint or tip is that uh, we can, of course, test uh, the browser, the, the server, by using the, um, the browser, okay? But the browser is very limited. If I want to compose a put command, how can I do that in a browser? Or, or a get uh, with some complex parameters and so on. So there's a nice tool, very, very simple, but very useful, inside the uh, um, Visual Studio Code, which is an extension that is called uh, REST Client. which is specifically useful for testing uh, HTTP calls, uh, and we'll see in a moment that why they are called REST. So if you install this uh, application, it will handle the files uh, with an extension called, uh, with an extension of HTTP. So I'm uh, in the same folder, I'm creating a file that I call uh, test.http, for example. So I'm creating a file with an extension .http, and inside that I can write uh, some HTTP calls, like that. I just wrote get slash, which is the HTTP command, okay, that the browser sent. If I end the uh, the extension recognizes this command and gives me this link send request. When I click on this, oh sorry, get uh, localhost, no get uh, where's the, sorry I don't remember, how do I set, sorry, uh, the, the server. Let me copy. Yeah. HTTP, localhost, 3000. Sorry, I need to provide the full address. And if I click on that, it will show me the full response coming from the server. So I have the uh, head, the first line of the response. Okay, I have the, all the headers of the response and the body of the response. So it's very handy because uh, I have all the, when I'm implementing some APIs, I can have all the tests there, and just by clicking send, I will see whether the response is okay. And uh, if I have more than one request in the same file, I can just separate them by, with uh, some three S signs, and uh, have, have another HTTP again, localhost, 3000, slash ABC, and I see if I send this, I will get a different response. That in this case, it will be a 404 error not found. So Express is responding by telling me there is no route activated for this uh, address. Okay? And I can also send some uh, post requests, uh, so for example, post, uh, uh, again, uh, something like, uh, I don't know, new user. And uh, we are faking some new data, and uh, we can, uh, uh, after the post, uh, give uh, uh, a body. Hmm. 
So when I click on this, uh, the, the extension will send a post request that, of course, will, will fail. Cannot post new user, okay, we know that. Uh, but uh, this will be the body that is sent uh, to the server. Okay, so it's very easy to compose our own get or post or put requests uh, and test them just interactively in the, in the Visual Studio Code uh, ID, yeah? Uh, we, so you're asking about uh, in which ports we are hosting the API server and which ports it, or hosts in general we are hosting the, the front end. We are not talking about the front end yet, okay? So, uh, of course, there, there will be options uh, whether the front end should run the same address as the back end or not, but then it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a choice. It's also complex to make uh, because there is a... Um, limitation in the browser called course uh, that prevents cross origin requests uh, so it's a it's a topic that we'll have to, to deal uh, uh, later on because it's mainly influenced by how the browser checks for the security normally an, an application cannot be uh, a JavaScript code can make a request to a different host from the hosting from which it was delivered unless you take extra precautions no, 3000 is just a convention for Express. Okay, so uh, uh, all the port numbers below 1000 are usually reserved for uh, the operating system, so they need uh, administration, administrator privileges. So the standard port is 80 normally. So in production, you, we, we, we would use the port number 80. In development, we can use any number. Usually, Express uses 3000, 3001, 3002, but it's just a convention. Okay, nothing. We don't need to use a low port, the standard port, because that would require us to run as an administrator, and we don't want, okay? Or maybe we also want to run more than one application at the same time, so they will have to run on different ports. We are just in development mode here. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, right now we can do whatever we want uh, in, by registering some API endpoints, some, say, some HTTP endpoints, uh, but uh, Express uh, is much more powerful than this because it, uh, it allows us to register some sort of middlewares that will help us in processing the requests. So uh, what we said before is that Express is already able to handle the HTTP protocol. That's already done. But maybe there are something, there are some extra functionality that are useful. Okay, for example, uh, converting, if you have a body of the request, uh, converting them into a JavaScript object by parsing the JSON file. So it's a useful uh, operation, but we don't, it can be done, okay, in the Java, you can just use uh, uh, JSON.parse uh, to call it. Uh, uh, but then you have to handle the errors, uh, you have to set uh, or read the, the content type uh, to check whether the, the, um, the file is correctly formatted and so on. This is a standard function, which is not standard in HTTP, but it's standard in developing the application. So we have some extension modules, some extensions, let's say, of, of Express that are called middlewares. What is a middleware? Middleware is simply a function in JavaScript, everything is function, that is called before my callback in every method call, or the method call where I specify it. So actually, I have, uh, I lied to you, the, uh, the, met the way of registering a route is not just path and my own callback, it's path, middlewares, one or more, and my callback. And the idea is that these middlewares are called, uh, in, if they have more than one, before my own callback. And what, what do they do? They receive a copy of the request and the response and can do some pre-processing on those. Can do some work for us. So we receive a request and a response where some fields are already being filled uh, with extra data or some operation has already been done. Um, we can execute a middleware 
in a specific method, and we specify it there, or if we want it to be executed on all requests, uh, we can use uh, this use syntax. We are registering the middleware on the whole application. So it will be automatically called before my callback every time. Uh, one useful one is, uh, uh, is that? this one. Uh, let me skip. Uh, usually, uh, Express responds to the request by calling my callbacks, but doesn't print anything, doesn't log anything. Okay? So, like, like here, I didn't see anything in this uh, window. Application started, I played with that, some uh, operation went, went okay, some gave error, but here it's silent. So it would be nice to have some, something that locks the request so that we, we can see what is happening, okay? And this is one such uh, uh, extension. It's called uh, Morgan. And how do you use it? So we can stop it, stop the application, install the middleware, npm install Morgan. Okay, now I have a Morgan in my project. I need to modify my, mis my, my web server from Morgan. And then I register Let me check if I did it correctly. Uh, yeah. And let's see what happens if I do this send. Sorry. Why doesn't it work? Okay. Uh, if I send a request, of course, uh, the HTTP extension uh, will show me the result, uh, but also the application is printing one line for each request. I say, like, okay, the, the request came from uh, 127.0.0.1. On this date, uh, the request was this one, get slash, and the status code was uh, 200, and the response was 20, 13 bytes. If I click on the other request, of course the response was 404 and uh, the web server just logged that it received the get ABC and the status was 404. Okay, so in this case, what we did here is uh, we called the function Morgan that uh, returned a middleware that just prints some key information about the request and the response uh, on the console. Hmm? In this case, we also have some warning because say, oh, but please, uh, you must specify the format uh, of logging. So, okay, if you go and check the documentation for Morgan, uh, for example, you say that uh, uh, this function will re require an argument that where you specify in which format you want the log file to appear with more or less information. For, for example, dev is for development. Okay, so to make it happy, let's restart the application by providing a format. That's the reason of the, of the, of the warning that we had before, okay? But, uh, and now if I make a request, I don't know why it's not working. Okay, the format is slightly different. Mm, but there are, if you go on the, on the Morgan website, you have the, the examples of the different uh, uh, formats that you can, uh, um, oh, for example, tiny or other type of formats that you can set, uh, depending on what, how you want it to be logged. So I think it's a useful feature for a web server always to show what it's doing so that you see that at least if the request went to the server, Okay, and then where, when, when the bugging. Hmm? And these are, it's working with the no, middleware analogy. You imagine that this function here is called uh, just before your, 
your code. Because it's being registered with upload user on the whole application. Or it could only register that on a subset of the application by providing a path, and then it will register only on the uh, request that start with that path. Or it can only re register that on a specific call. And in this case, it would write uh, say Morgan, uh, I don't know, tiny here, and that will be executed just here. And if I have more than one middleware, there's no problem. I can just uh, put them together. It's an array of functions. Each of them is a function. And the function, has, they, all, uh, they all have the same uh, structure. All the, uh, they have the same signature. They get a copy of the request and the response. And they have a next callback to go to the next one. Okay, if you are implementing a middleware, the last uh, instruction of your code should be next. So schedule the next middleware. If you don't call next, then the processing of the request is stopped there. So you can also prevent further processing of the request. So you can reject it soon. For example, all the authentication middlewares do that. They check if the authentication is OK. And if it's OK, they call next, so they go to your callback. Otherwise, they send an error right away, and the process is not um, the request is not processed further. Hmm? Uh, we have one middleware which is already predefined in Express, which is called static. When you have a lot of files, no, uh, static files like images, like JavaScript code, like uh, that they need to run on the, on the browser, uh, images, HTML files, and so on. How can you provide them to the browser? Uh, you should register all the paths, and for each of them, read the file and send the file. Uh, very boring. And the static middleware is doing this boring work for you. What middleware is doing is uh, you give them the name of a directory, okay, public, and it will automatically create many routes uh, for each uh, of the files inside that directory. Okay, for example, let's imagine I have, uh, in my Express application, I want to create a directory. Let's call it public, why not? And in this public directory, I create a one file. Sorry, it was not a file. I created a file instead of a, of a folder. In Express, new folder, public. Inside public, I create a file, mm, info.txt, I don't know. Hmm? And uh, this, in the f this is my information. Just one file there. OK, I want this file to be accessible in as a get, get HTTP localhost 3000. Oops. slash info.txt. OK? So this is not automatic, because at, the, at this moment, this URL is not, uh, this path is not registered. But the middleware, the um, static middleware, will browse the content of the public folder and create one path, one route for every file that it finds there with the same name. So for doing that, uh, I just have to register another. I can register more middleware. They will just be called in sequence. So uh, user, it will be express. Dot static, public. I don't need to import a new module because the, the static middleware is already built in inside Express. So at this point, uh, probably this request uh, is going to zero, 0 OK, and this is my information. So when you have the set of static files uh, to be made available over HTTP, the uh, 
static middleware is the way to go. We'll publish a folder. You can publish it uh, at the root of your website like this, or you can publish it in a subfolder of a website. Okay, just uh, this argument here is the folder on your computer where the files reside, and this path here is the URL at which they appear from the browser, then be published on the web with that name, with the name. They, and the names can be different. So I'm registering this folder to appear under slash static on my website. If I don't provide this, they will be published under the, the root of the website. You see there's nothing between, between this and that. Of course you can Register more than one static handler for mapping different set of folders if you want. It's all very flexible. At the end of the day, you have to provide your own uh, callback, but before your callback, you have a lot of helpers, middlewares that do some work for you. Uh, another important task you have to do is to interpret the query parameters. So imagine you have uh, some uh, uh, request like this which is a typical syntax being used by forms in HTML pages. Okay, you have the login when you have the parameter, question mark uh, starts, uh, separates the URL from the parameters. The parameters are in the form key value and key value and they are separated by ampersand signs. This is the part of the HTTP syntax for URLs. You cannot change it. The browser knows that it will compose the request like that. So. If you want to extract the user and the password, oh, of course, you will never send a password in clear like that, of course, okay? But it's just an example. Um, if you want to extract the user and the password from this, okay, you have the request object. So you have all this string. No? We have all this string in the request object. But it's boring, we, 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 we would have to parse it to separate the question mark and then take care of the escaping characters and, okay, that's a boring word. And actually, Express is already parsing it for us and inside the request object, it will inject a query object, a query property that will contain many properties for each of the parameters of the query. So this is all automatic. It will tell you, you don't need any middleware for this. So if you have a query that contains some parameters, these parameters are already available to you inside the request.query. We don't need to parse this line here, this string here. Okay? Um, and if we need, to, okay, this is for parameters that are encoded in the request like forget. If we have some data which is uh, encoded in the body of the request, like in a post or in a put. So for example, we have the same information which is not in the get line, but is here is in the uh, body of the request. The browser, the JavaScript and browser compose this and will send us uh, some, some JavaScript object with a lot of information. Again, we need to check the syntax, parse it, and so on, and this is already done by this middleware, Esprit.json. In this case, we have to register the middleware. And this middleware will be activated every time it will see the content type equal to JSON. And so, okay, okay, this request has a body in JSON format. I should transform it into an object and populate a request.body with the properties corresponding to the, the properties of this object. So we'll, uh, this is a, remember, this is a string in the body. We are passing these strings and are creating, so whatever, properties. in request.body. So, 
This middleware will help us doing the boring works of parsing the request and building the object and so on. Every time you must, uh, you need uh, no, to uh, process some data in JavaScript format, remember to register the express.json middleware, okay? It doesn't hurt registering it, so let's do that. Use express.json. Again, it's already predefined. You don't need to install anything else. If you happen to need to process data coming from a form, which is we won't do, uh, you have another middleware that will process data with, that is encoded into the HTTP URL encoded format, which is another format. Okay. Um, okay. Just of course, as you can imagine, when you are registering a path. You may use wildcards or something like that to register a group of paths at the same time. So you can have regular expressions or with simple wildcards or more complex regular expression as a parameter for your methods. Okay? If you need to match many different or similar routes with the same activation. But this is quite expected. Okay? And the more interesting part is that you can build a parametric, a parametric route with placeholders inside. So this is not something that is, has to do with the browser parameters. We are saying, I want to manage to match all the routes of this form, slash users, slash something, that they call user ID, slash box, slash something else. So imagine that uh, as a sort of a wild card, okay? Users, asterisk, books, asterisk. Anything that, met, that looks like this, like for example, this URL here below, is matched, and so it will uh, activate that specific callback. So that callback will be executed for all the URLs that look like this one, plus, uh, the content of the first wildcard blocks is put automatically into a variable called user ID. And the content of the second one is stored into a property called book ID. And these properties are inside another object called params in the request. So the request contains three useful fields. Query, request.query, that contains all the va variables and values that are after the question mark in the URL. Body, request.body, that contains uh, the properties coming from a JavaScript object that may have been in the request body. And the request.param, parameters, that contains all the fragments of the URL that you declared as parametric. Okay, so you have three ways of getting information into a callback. Putting this information into the body of the request and then extract it with request body. Putting information in the query parameters, question mark, name equal to value, and you get them into request.query or constructing or building an address that contains this information in the middle and extracting that with requested params. Of course, you are, with this syntax of the semicolon here, you are specifying which fragments are variables and need to be injected and which other fragments are fixed. Huh? Like slash users is a fixed segment, user ID is a variable segment, it's a parametric segment of the query. And in, no. so we have these three mechanisms for sending information to the web server. Um, I, I'm not discussing this right now, but it was just another example of a middleware uh, 
when we do client server application, we'll need to check about data validation, data checking. There's a, there are middlewares, for example, for validating uh, the parameters that you get. Okay, there are, there's a, there are a lot of uh, middleware that can be useful uh, for, for our applications. Okay, so this is the basic. This is the basic mechanism for creating a, um, a web server. What do, you, do we use it for? Okay, let's just uh, spend five more minutes before the break to understand what you are using it for. Uh, like we said at the beginning, the, our main goal here is to create a set of APIs uh, that will support our application. So imagine you have a, our application the, of the question and answers. Uh, it will be a web application that offers uh, some API, some method for adding a new question, for adding an answer to a given question, for listing all the questions, for listing all the questions by a given user, for uh, 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 listing all the answers to a given question. So a lot of primitives that are similar to the one that we you know, play with last week, the primitive operation that you could do with the, those two data types. But right now, we are no longer in a JavaScript code that directly accesses the information from the local database. We are imagining that this information in the database is made available to the world through HTTP, to any JavaScript code that may run in any browser in the world. We provide an interface for that, interface over HTTP a programming interface over HTTP. So we have an application somewhere written by us or written by other people, and we want to provide all this kind of application some accesses to our data in a controlled way. We don't want just to expose the database itself. Some operations, some API, some interfaces to execute some specific operations in, on my data. How can we do that? Uh, we can, since uh, we are in the web uh, domain, we should encode everything according to HTTP. So we must map all the information we have in the database into addresses, URLs, that represent objects. Because URLs are the identifier of information in, in HTTP. And all the information should be exchanged in a format which is easy to exchange. For example, JavaScript objects, which are, that have a very simple syntax and are very easy to parse in any programming language. Basically. And, uh, sorry, I will show just the other picture. And uh, so we can decide that we have some object that we want to query, read, or modify, we represent this object into JavaScript object format. We do some operations on these objects, uh, and the objects themselves are represented as uh, URLs, as addresses. So what we are going to do in, after the break is to try to abstract the operations that we can do on a database uh, on a neutral format uh, that can be mapped easily into HTTP verbs. And that will be our des design criteria, design toolkit for creating APIs. Okay? So it will be the next step. Uh, we are not going to implement uh, client server websites in the traditional way using Express. We are using Express for building a set of APIs. In, uh, after the break, after 15 minutes or so, let's try to, we'll try to play with that level. <laughs>